Good afternoon. I would like to preface my remarks by saying to those for whom the following applies that I love you as my brother priests and as my brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you. What I will say does not mean that I was never guilty of such actions, intentions, or omissions. It rather points to errors that are still being made today in Jesus Christ Church by his ministers and by his followers. I was asked yesterday by someone here if I still, if I got messages from Blessed Mother, I have. And I have to say with regards to what I'm about to tell you that you're the, well, you are the first to hear the following. The Blessed Mother told me in a message that uh, when I went out in missions to speak that I was not to entertain people, that I should not expect consolation, that I had to speak to you the words of her Holy Spirit with regards to why I was spared. I see many areas to be addressed in the church today, and I can truthfully say that all my my expertise to the fact that I was judged by Almighty God and was spared in His divine mercy. Today is a very special day to me. Our Lord, in a message to me some time ago, said that I am a walking example of His mercy. The following is the second part and the most important part of my experience that I have to address to the Catholic Church worldwide. And I would like to again preface my remarks by saying that not everyone that I am addressing is guilty. So please keep that in mind. The first area that needs attention all over the world is the matter of confessions. One only has to go to a parish on a weekend to see the downfall and the collapse of this great sacrament which was instituted by Christ himself. Jesus instituted the sacrament with his first appearance to his apostles after he rose from the dead. His first words to them after he entered the upper room through a bolted door was, Peace be with you. And again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. And whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. We find that in John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. This is why confession takes place, the sacrament of reconciliation, and why the priests are recipients of such power to forgive or to withhold forgiveness. So what's the problem? The problem is that there are fewer and fewer who feel any sense of guilt and consequently feel that they have sinned. If one does not feel any guilt, there is no need to go to confession. One, in his or her own mind, has not sinned. So where does society get this notion? 
I blame a great deal on psychologists and psychiatrists who have told people, and sometimes publicly, that they don't have to feel guilty about this or that. They should put the blame on their parents in bringing, up, bringing them up the way that they did, or blame the environment which contributed to the problem facing the client. The task or solution is to completely eradicate guilt in a person. This is one of the greatest phenomena that has contributed to the decline in confessions today. Another reason for the decline is the fact that some priests, well-intentioned as they are, advise penitents that he or she do not have to go to confession often. And then when the penitent verbalizes a sin or a number of sins, the confessor is quick to tell them that such and such is not sinful, but rather a result of tension, anxiety, or overtiredness. Consequently, the penitent is made to feel or to think that most of all of his sins or her sins are really not sinful at all, but merely human weaknesses that are due to some physical abnormality or phenomena. Most Catholics do not have a choice in confessors. Some go to other parishes where there is a priest who is more traditional in his treatment of a penitent, but some feel they cannot leave the parish boundaries to attain the peace of mind and soul that they are so desperately looking for. The results of these encounters are that people no longer feel a need to go to confession. Plus, they feel the confessor is not as compassionate and as understanding as priests used to be. One of the biggest atrocities of the priesthood today and raging rampant in all parts of the world, especially the United States as I've seen it today, is the verbalization of opinions by priests to laity about matters of church doctrine. Priests sometimes forget that they are ordained representatives of the church and therefore should preach what the church teaches. Thank you. Thank you. If a priest wishes to give his, his opinion on a matter that has been strictly defined by the magisterium of the church, then he should take off his collar and tell those whom he addresses that the following is his opinion regarding the matter. This goes for confessional practice and for the pulpit as well. Priests are ordained ministers of the church. One of the greatest admissions in parish life in the past 25 or, or 26 years is the fact that the priests have not mentioned or directed in their homilies the subjects of hell, eternal punishment, and God's righteous judgment or his righteous, uh, uh, righteousness, his anger, the righteousness uh, uh, opposite of his love. If that is the fact, then the idea of a parishioner feeling or coming to terms with the fact that they had, have to or should go to confession is totally missing. We have not wanted to upset parishioners, and we especially do not want to upset wealthy parishioners <laughs> who write large checks to the parish and are good givers. <laughs> Consequently, what has been addressed in sermons has been peace, love, and joy. These, to be sure, will not upset anyone, and consequently the priest will have given a good sermon that weekend. And here again, if there is no guilt, then there's no sin. So why should a parishioner go to confession? The reality, too, is a father wants to be popular sometimes. He wants people to go away from his parish feeling good and not guilty. And he wants most of all for people to say on their way out of church, Father, that was a fantastic sermon. 
The second area that should be addressed in our discussion of the misfortunes of the church today is the area of prayer and non-prayer. The obviously with it parish is one that you can pick up a document from which informs you of all the organizations in the parish that are there to facilitate healing processes and generally whatever area of interest or problem area that one is encountering. Organizations such as organizations for the recently divorced or widowed, for singles, for parents, etc. And the fact is that most of these organizations are nothing more than social events. Thank you. Where a person is made to feel like he or she can be helped in their situation because there are people encountering the same situation. Whatever happened to prayer? Ever since Vatican II, which was greatly misinterpreted and misunderstood, a lot of paraliturgical services have been unduly dismissed from parishes all over the world at the discretion of priests and parishes. Prayer vigils such as novenas, holy hours, benediction, and even perpetual adoration of the Blessed Sacrament have been deleted from parish activities for quite some time now. It seems as if we're proclaiming prayer is useless. Let's have a problem-solving situation or organization to remedy the situation. Prayer was needed in the past. Why not now? And then, too, there might be another reason for the demise of prayer situations. These services take time. And that's one thing that some priests don't want their parishioners to think they have too much of. And two, a prayer service may take away from the priest's TV time or going out to relax time with parishioners or friends or even other priests. The sign that a lot of priests wear is a sign which tells their parishioners, I'm exhausted. Please, don't ask me to do anything else. Consequently, the parish priest has more and more and more time to do absolutely nothing. Another area where we are seeing a definite decline of traditional spirituality is seeing what has happening, been happening what has happened to many of our churches on the inside. In the name of ecumenism, a lot is being done that strips us now of our Catholic faith and makes us something less than who we were and who we were baptized to be. Many churches now do not have kneelers. (laughs) Theater seats in some of these churches are sufficient. There are no stations of the cross, no statues, no vigil lights, no candles, no pictures of Jesus, Mary, or one of the saints, and no crucifix. A crucifix, a cross, yes, but a crucifix, no. The crucifix has the body of Christ on it. That's offensive to our non-Catholic brethren. Also, the presidential chair has replaced the tabernacle at the center of the sanctuary. Father, thank you. Father is now the focal point and not some nondescript vault that just has wafers of bread in it. The tabernacle is now off to the side 
or unfortunately in another room in the church, but definitely out of sight. The actions of believers, in quotation marks, is concomitant with the atmosphere, or lack thereof, of the inside of these churches. The Father or the parishioners do not genuflect anymore in front of the Blessed Sacrament. They give a little bow. <laughs> the parishioners are encouraged or even forced to, at some times to remain standing for the consecration. <laughs> Kneeling is so old-fashioned, don't you know? One, too, might look on how parishioners dress for Mass these days, a very casual, if not slovenly, way. And one might mention also that the more fastidious parishes have lay ministers who have been commissioned to do almost everything in the parish except say mass, hear confessions, marry, and bury. I know of a certain parish in Washington State, in the United States, where the pastor has a lay woman give the homily at masses during the weekend for three weekends out of four. And some churches, the priest will sit in the chair at communion time while the extraordinary ministers distribute Holy Communion under one or both species. Thank you. This is forbidden. But it seems that the less Father has to do, the better. In the 1950s, one heard the comment that there was no greater fraternity than that of the priests. At that time, that was probably a true statement of where the priesthood was and what priests meant to each other. But things have changed since then, and it is a whole new ball game now. Priests now are not so supportive of fellow priests. In one diocese in the United States, and I suspect that the same is true all over the world, there are generally two ways of looking at one's fellow priests. One is, Father is doing a, a magnificent job and is really trying, and his fellow priests are saying, what's he trying to prove? The other is the fact that Father may not have uh, both oars in the water, so to speak. He may have made some error, grave or minute. His fellow priests are saying, see, I told you so. What else can you expect from someone like that? This is sad, to say the least. And then, where is the priest to turn for help? If one goes to a fellow priest for a help spiritually or otherwise, the invitation will come automatically to have a drink or to discuss football or basketball, a rugby or cricket game, the teams and the scores. After all, when priests get together, they shouldn't talk shop. They should enjoy their golf game or the dinner out and not turn the situation into some, some type of counseling situation or session. But ironically enough, we still have in our diocese priests who are referred to as a priest priest. These men are seen by other priests as holy and as gifted priests one can go to if needed by any priest who is having difficulties with almost anything. The final area of concern for, the purposes is, for our purposes is that of CCD, the Confraternity of Christian Doctrine classes, the classes for students who are unable to attend Catholic schools for religion. At least since the beginning of the 70s, our CCD texts have been void of Catholic doctrine and dogma. Thank you. I have seen CCD texts, 
class texts that have a picture of a smiling Jesus on one page and then on the other page in bold type the sentence, Jesus loves you. That is what our children have been learning all these past years. They have been not been, they have been left out learning the commandments, the laws of the church, mortal and venial sin, and the difference between the two. They have been denied learning how to make a good confession by examining their consciences. They have been denied learning what is possibly short of faith concerning the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. The ultra-casual way of receiving communion by the faithful has added to the dilemma. Parents do not go to confession. And so their children don't go either. And parents do not make their children go to, con to confession or CCD anymore. Parents, after all, want their children to love them. Consequently, they don't make their children do anything they don't want to do. The list of monstrosities could go on and on. But this gives to the priests, to the laypersons, some idea of the direction the church is now heading. Where would this all lead to? I'm not a prophet, but I do know that this most assuredly is not what our Lord intended his church to do or to be. Is it too late to change? Again, what Jesus is saying to us and has always said is that it is never too late to change. Thank you. He states very categorically that we should take advantage of his mercy while we still can because when he comes as judge it will be too late for his mercy. He is patient, he is merciful, and he's loving. God bless you. That's a bit different, isn't it? Oh, ho, ho. shades of my late father there.